Hi guys, welcome to the Knitting Expert Podcast FAQs <laughs> edition. So I get a lot of frequently asked questions or questions that get asked of me quite often, as it were. Um, a lot of these get asked repeatedly over periods of time. And so while some of these questions are ones that I've answered in previous episodes, um, you know, I don't necessarily, I don't expect everyone who has just started watching the podcast to go back and watch all the other episodes that are out there because there are a lot and it takes a lot of time. So, um, I thought what I would do is create this standalone frequently asked questions video for you all, um, to answer some of the most commonly asked questions that people ask me. And that way, hopefully, uh, if you do have a question, you will be able to refer back to this video if that, if your question is one of the ones that I answer. I hope that makes some sense. I will have a list of the questions that I answer in this ep in this episode, in this video, below in the description box on YouTube, and I will post this in the questions and suggestions thread in the group with the list of questions that this video covers in the heading section. So you can, if you have a question that is potentially answered in this video, you can just check this video first. And then if it doesn't answer your question, then feel free to post your question in the thread. So I'm hoping that will help cut down a little bit on um, repetitively, repeatedly answering the same questions again and again. So uh, I hope that this will be useful for those of you who are interested. So the first question I'm going to ask, and this is one that I get asked every time I'm about to go on a trip, is knitting while traveling and taking knitting onto a plane. Have I ever had issues with knitting while traveling? Not really, no. Um, has anyone ever stopped me taking my knitting on a plane? No. Um, I've heard horror stories of it happening to other people. Um, I had an incident actually just on this last trip when we were flying back from Dubai at the airport in Dubai. Um, someone took issue with uh, the needles that I had on my shawl, this one. And I had my high, high sharps. It was, they were four millimeters though. And she was, she pulled them out and she was just like, what is this? like it's for knitting and I showed her the yarn and I showed her what I was wearing and I was like look it's, it's just for knitting and I'm not she's like okay go um but that's about the most I've ever had with my knitting issues on planes the only other time was um I packed a pair of scissors that were that were like normal scissors they weren't travel safe scissors so those got confiscated but again they had nothing to do with my knitting so um as a general rule if I'm taking socks on a plane and I am taking them in a metal needles like high high sharps or um, Adi turbos or chai goos or whatever other metal needles that you enjoy using for socks, I always carry a um, wooden bamboo circulars as well. Um, because then if they do decide on the, at security that for some reason they don't want to let me through with those needles. I can transfer them onto these so I don't lose my stitches and I can keep knitting potentially if I want to. Um, so I always carry a couple of these with, or put one in each sock project that I'm carrying onto the plane with me. If it's in check luggage, it's not an issue, but it's for carry on. I try to avoid taking my best needles onto a plane again, just in case something happens or they get confiscated. Um, but like I said, I've never really had any issues before. Um, and as time has gone on, I've become slightly bolder about what I take onto planes. Like I never used to take metal needles onto planes. Now I pretty much always take metal needles onto planes. No one's ever stopped me. I've never had any issues. Um, so yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. And I'm not sure if I've popped one in here yet or not, but, um, but yeah, as for as for what I actually take with me traveling, I take to I tend to have like one master notions pouch of all the little things that I think I'm gonna need while I'm traveling. So things like a um, like a knitting gauge, like one of these sort of rulers, um, tape measure, like a couple of pens, um, any sort of uh, moisturizer uh, for my hands, uh, spare needles any sort of needle, DPNs, I would carry DPNs in case I need to use them for, you know, holding stitches or whatever. Uh, some scrap yarn, safety pins, stitch markers, you know, all the usual notions, darning needles, tapestry needles, um, all those sorts of things that you would normally carry around in a project bag. I put everything into like one large notions pouch and usually have multiples of each thing. So then if, when I get wherever I'm traveling, if I want to put a few things in one project bag, then I can, and I still have the others for other things as well. 
Um, I basically just take what I would normally use for knitting and a few extra needles in different sizes that I think I might want to want to knit with. So I usually have an idea of what projects I'm going to take with me or yarn I'm going to take for specific projects. So if I know I'm taking a couple of shawl projects, a, um, a few sock projects and maybe a garment project, I have, in, I have in my mind what size needles I need for those projects. So I make sure to take those needles and then I take a couple of other sizes just in case something else comes up. Um, yeah, so otherwise, like I said, I don't think I've ever had any problems with knitting whilst traveling. If anything, I get interest from um, from the stewardesses and stuff on planes. They always come over and ask what I'm working on and they always seem to be quite interested in it. But I've never had any problems, so we will see. Um, so yeah, I will let you know if that ever changes. <laughs> The second question I get asked quite often is how do I make my mini skeins? Now I actually showed how I do that on episode 47, um, so you can go check that out if you want to actually see me doing it. I don't have anything handy to be able to do it right now, but I'll explain roughly what I do. So I take the yarn and I use a 30 centimeter or 12 inch ruler um, and I sort of just wrap, I wrap the yarn around the ruler and I weigh the yarn before I start. And then as it's on the, sat on the scale, I just wrap until I've wrapped about five or six grams. And then I cut the yarn. And then I pull the yarn off the ruler and I twist it around my fingers. I just twist it around to tighten it up and then bring it together and create the skein. It's actually a very simple process. Um, let me see if I have a mini skein here to show you what I mean. Okay, so this is a mini skein. So, once you're done wrapping it around the ruler, pop it off the ruler and then just twist it up. I put my thumb in the middle, pull one end through the other and that, there you go, mini skein. Mini skein. Um, so yeah, but if you want to see that in more detail and slightly better explained, then that is in episode 47. Um, I had a question from someone, and I get this question every now and again, so I thought I would just answer it, is how did I get started designing? Ironically, my very first project <laughs> is how I started designing, in th I guess. Um, I, when I very first started to learn how to knit, I, I don't know, I don't think I ever really considered anything to be beyond, beyond my reach or beyond the realm of abilities. Um, I don't think anything ever really intimidated me. It was all a matter of just, if I didn't know how to do something, the only reason I would put it off wasn't because I was scared. It would be because I just didn't have the time to dedicate to learning that new skill. Nothing ever really scares me. Like even now, there's nothing that I look at and be like, oh, I don't want to knit that because I can't knit it. It's more, I don't want to knit that because I don't want to dedicate the time to knitting it right now um, or to learning how to knit that technique. Um, but so when I first started learning to knit, I kind of went off on a tangent there, so sorry. Um, I was following a written tutorial for a cowl that's knit flat in garter stitch and then you have a button. So you just button it closed at one side. And the pattern said to cast on 20 stitches. So I cast on 25 because clearly I knew better. And I knew, and I was like, I cast on 20 stitches. I was like, this isn't going to be big enough. That can't be right. <laughs> so I cast on 25 because like I said, clearly I knew better for my very first project. Lo and behold, it ended up being so wide, ridiculously wide. Um, and I ended up turning it into a bag. I seamed up the sides. I, I left a bit of a flap for a lid and it actually still lives down there. You see that bit of cream and red? That's the bag. I've shown it on previously and I talked quite a bit about how I get started, how I got started with knitting and started designing in episode eight. Episode eight, which is titled um, My Knitting Firsts. Where I talk about a lot of the first things that I ever did with knitting, first sort of projects, first designs, first, a lot of firsts with knitting in that episode. And uh, yeah, so like I said, I kind of started technically designing from the get-go. Um, I modified patterns a lot. I realized over time that um, one of the first things I modified was yarn choices because I inevitably could almost never, almost never had the right yarn that the pattern called for, so I always substituted something else. And from there, then I you know made other changes to patterns and adjusted stitch counts and 
<coughs> so knitting maths never scares me never has scared me i've always actually quite enjoyed maths it's one of those things that um you quite it's one of those things that has a very definitive right or wrong answer it's, there's no gray there's very little gray area when it comes to mathematics so i really enjoy that aspect of it so i'm always been quite happy to sit there and do the calculations and make the modifications and stuff to patterns um so i started with that sort of stuff and then eventually moved on to just knitting things that i came up with and then eventually started designing patterns intentionally as in with you know with the intention of um designing a pattern to be written up before when i designed something it wasn't really with the thought of it being a design it was just oh i want to knit that i can't really find a pattern that does it so i'll do it myself and kind of just go with it and not really taking detailed notes on how i did it um and so yeah i designed my first project i think the first thing i published was around april april last year so almost a year ago now since i started designing and yeah and i've learned i've learned a lot with every single thing that i've done going forward and I've definitely grown a lot over this last year since podcasting and designing and making bags and all that sort of stuff it's been a whirlwind whirlwind and it's been great I've really been enjoying it um so yeah I hope that kind of answers that question on designing if you have any other specific questions about designing that you'd like to know then please do let me know um like I said episode eight covers a lot of stuff about um knitting firsts and how I got into designing and stuff like that as well so if you're interested you can check that episode out um Another question I get asked quite often is how did we end up in the Middle East? How did we get here? Why why did we choose to come here? Well, when Perry and I first started dating and going out, um, we talked about what we wanted out of life pretty early on. Um, I was at that point where I realised that, you know, I don't want to... I wanted to make sure that whoever I was going to be with was on the same page as me in terms of what we wanted out of life. And thankfully, Perry and I are pretty much on the same page with everything. Uh, we both love to travel. He did a four month round the world trip effectively. He drove from London to Mongolia on the Mongol rally. If you've heard of that, if you haven't, Google it, it's pretty awesome. And uh, then he traveled through China, Japan, North America um, before coming back. So it was about four months in total that he was gone. He pretty much drove most of it as well. Um, I think the only bits he didn't drive were China and Japan. Um, and I like to travel. I've traveled loads um, over the years. I've always, it was one of those things that I prioritize over material things um, is traveling. Both of us do that. Uh, it For us, it's, it's a priority. So it's something that we quite happily spend our money on. And it's something we enjoy doing. So whilst we can and whilst we can afford to do it, we will. Um, and because of that, we both knew that we, we'd like the opportunity to work abroad. I did it before. I'd already done it once. By the time Perry and I were going out, I'd already lived in Vancouver for a year. Um, the course I did at university was called Quantity Surveying and Consultancy. Um, so those of you who don't know, Quantity Surveying is um, financial management for construction projects. It's possibly the easiest way of describing what it is. It's a lot more than that, but the crux of it is, is dealing with the finances for a construction project, whether it's from a client side or from a con contractor's side. And so, because all we learnt at school was, all we learnt at university was theory. Um, you know, it's one of those careers, I guess, that you know, until you actually get into industry and practice, it's difficult. So one of the options our university offered was, was to do a year out in industry between your second and third year of, um, of school. So I took that and then I was like, well, if I'm gonna take a year out and I didn't take a gap year, which I had wanted to, but because of the changing school fees, um, university fees and stuff. If I'd taken a gap year, my university fees would have tripled in that year. So um, I couldn't justify doing it. Um, so I thought if I'm going to take a year out, I'm going to go abroad. I'm going to go, as, you know, I'm going to travel if I'm doing this. So I went to Vancouver. I managed to get a job in Vancouver and I lived there, I lived downtown for the year. I had family over there at the time. I still do have some family there. And it was a really, really good year and I enjoyed it so much the first time I'd ever done anything like that and after that I knew that I could live abroad again I could do this again whether it's back in Vancouver or somewhere else and Perry had always been really interested in the idea of living abroad and you know doing something different and uh so yeah it was about two years after we started dating that uh we really started looking into it 
Um, we hadn't really thought that anything would come of it straight away. We thought it'd be about six months or so before we ever really got anywhere with it. But within a couple of months of starting to look around, Perry got offered a job in Dubai. So, so we did. We 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 got engaged and accepted the job offer the same weekend. Uh, we were when we went to Paris, and then yeah, within a couple of months, we were, we moved out to Dubai, and our lives changed. It was it was incredible. It was a really good experience. We really enjoyed it. There's been some hard lessons learned, um, but really good overall. I think it's definitely changed us for the better. We've learned how to deal with certain things and we've grown a lot as people together and it's just been a really, really good experience. Um, I definitely would recommend traveling and seeing the world or, you know, even if you get an opportunity to live somewhere else for a while, even if it's just a couple of months, totally take it. Um, we've very much been people who will give every opportunity its due consideration. We don't just knock something down just because we don't like the sound of it initially. We will always look into everything, you know, do our due, due diligence and um, make sure that it's, make sure that we're really certain to about turning it down before we turn it down. There have been a couple of things where job opportunities or potential job opportunities have cropped up and on the outset, like it doesn't really sound like anything particularly interesting. And Perry's been quite tempted to just like dismiss it straight off the bat. And I'd be like, no, well, why don't you just ask some questions and see what it's about? And it might be something you're interested in. And sometimes it turns out to be something interesting and sometimes it doesn't, but it's always worth checking out. And there's been a couple of times, I remember when Perry was offered the job for Saudi, for the job that he's doing now, he came home and he was like, oh, I don't know. I'm not thinking, uh, I don't know. I don't think I should take it, blah, blah. I was like, what are you talking about? What is it? And he explains the job. And I said, well, why, why are you thinking of turning that down? It sounds like a really good opportunity. He was like, well, it's in Saudi Arabia. I'm like, okay, but we can deal with that. Like that is not, that is not a deal breaker for us. Oh, for me anyway. So I was like, well, why, if, if the reason, if the location of the job is the one thing that is putting you off taking it, then that's a ridiculous reason not to take the jobs if it's something that's interesting to you. So we made it work and we live in Bahrain and he commutes to Saudi Arabia and it works for us. I mean, it's not perfect, but it works. And at least he gets to come home every night, which is when he's here anyway, which is great. Um, but yes, like I said, we've moved around uh, based on jobs and where we are in life at the time. We, I try not to look too far ahead to think about where we're gonna be in the future because I have no idea. If I look back on where I where I was a few years ago and back then, I never would have guessed I'd be where I am now. So I try not to think about it too much. I try not to stress about it too much because it can be quite daunting. I just, I'm kind of like, you know what? Things work out the way they work out. And it's usually for the best, to be honest. Um, so yeah, we left Dubai because Perry got this job in Saudi Arabia and we moved to Bahrain. I still technically work for the company I work for in Dubai. I work from home remotely just one or two days a week whenever stuff comes up so it's not a bad setup and uh yeah that's how that's how we've ended up where we are perry is currently studying for an mba which is why um one of the reasons why he took this job because they gave him the flexibility to be able to do the studies that he wanted to do and uh and yeah so but as to how long we're going to stay here we don't know we have no idea uh like i said we're always open to potential opportunities elsewhere and stuff and we've never um, turned anything down without looking into it and it's just one of those things we will see what happens Perry's studies finish towards the end of the year and we'll probably have a better idea of what we're going to be doing for the next couple of years once that's over um, so yeah for now we're here and we're enjoying it for what it is for now and uh, yeah that's how we ended up here I hope again I hope this answered the question I do realize I tend to go off on tangents every now and again so I apologize for that and the next question I have is from someone, and I get this question every now and again, is how to get matching pairs of socks with stripes. <coughs> and one thing I find that really helps to get matching pairs of socks with self-striping yarn is if you cast on at a color change. So um, you have your two balls of yarn, for example, and you get to the same point in the color changes and then you cast, you start casting on from this color change. So in this case, the tail is yellow. So you'll have one line of yellow around the top of your sock before you go into the rest of the color changes. So you'll see that here on my Harry Potter socks. I cast on at the color change 
between the red and the yellow. So my cast on edge is in the red and then I started knitting in the yellow um, stitches and that's how I get my socks to match to begin with. Um, with and that works with self-striping, with pretty much all self-striping that works. Then I had a very specific question about um, how to get variegated yarns to line up to get matching socks. And frankly, you can't do that. I, um, I'm afraid to say that if you have a variegated skein of yarn, you're gonna have fraternal socks. You're never gonna have matching, perfectly matching socks. Um, these ones, for example, I mean, this is a little bit different because this does kind of stripe in a way, but they're not perfectly lined up. The colors don't line up exactly. Um, you know, they're not gonna be perfectly matchy-matchy. This probably wasn't the best example, but you can't, because it's variegated or because it's, um, yeah, because it's variegated and it's not dyed self-striping or tonal or solid, you're not gonna get a matching pair of socks. It's, it's impossible to get that to work, unless, unless the dyer has dyed two 50 gram skeins in the exact same way. And even then there'll be slight differences, but that'll be as close as you get to getting a matching pair of variegated socks. Double knit sock blanks, that is the only way. <laughs> Double knit sock blanks where you, if you've ever knit from a sock blank, you know it's, it's, a, it's a piece of pre-knitted fabric that has then been dyed. And then um, you pull the strands, so it's like you're on, it's almost like you're frogging it and you knit from the frogging end and you just knit straight from the blank and some indie dyers dye um, sock blanks that have been knit up with two strands held together and that's that's one way to get matching variegated yarn socks but if it's just a skein a hank it's not gonna happen <coughs> I also got a question about um, what ball winder I use and I get again I get this question quite often Few months ago about six months ago now i've got a stanwood needlecraft ball winder and i know they have several models i bought the middle of the range model so they have the small one the medium one and then they have this like big massive large one that does like 500 gram ridiculous size skates uh i got the middle one um it's attached to my table right now so i can't take it off but um when you look at their when you look at the ball winders that they offer there's three different sizes and mine's the middle one um i also get questions about swatching and how i knit my swatches specifically in the round to be honest i don't swatch in the round all that often because i don't really knit um sweaters all that often and i i, I also don't find that my gauge is all that different between in the round and flat i have swatched in the round before and um, my gauge has never been significantly different enough, like not even half a stitch um, between in the round and flat. So for, I just, sorry, I just swatch in the, I just swatch flat, whether it's an object in the round or flat, because um, I don't find it makes a difference for me and for my gauge. If you are unsure and you want to knit in the swatch, knit a swatch in the round, you can either knit like magic loop and knit the two sides, kind of like knitting a sock leg or you can what some people do is that you knit it flat so you knit to the end and then you push the, the stitches back to the other end of the needle so you knit it on circulars or dpns push to the other end of the needle and then just carry the yarn around the back loosely and then start knitting again and you just keep doing that which works but you get all the long strands of yarn being carried around the back and your edge stitches are ridiculously all loose and all over the place which drives some people crazy which I totally get but those are really the only two ways of swatching in the round you either knit a tube like you would a sock or a hat knitting a hat could also work as a swatch um, or you do it where you carry the yarn around the back but that does feel like you're wasting a lot of yarn um, those are the only ways that I'm aware of anyway and the only ways that I've ever tried before. Uh, I, I get, next question, sorry. Next question I get a lot is about how I photograph my knitting when I'm wearing it. Uh, I usually get Perry to help me out or I have a tripod set up with my camera and I have a remote release, remote shutter release for my camera, which I hold in my hand and just click the shutter and hope that I'm in. And I usually pre-check where the camera frame 
of focus is. And I always pre-select the focus point on my camera to be in the middle because I have an SLR camera. Um, I pre-select the focus point to be in the center and I kind of try and figure out where that is in the frame where I'm going to be standing and I try to make sure I stand there so the camera focuses on me. Doesn't always work out too great. It works out most of the time, but to be certain that it's going to be focused, I get Perry to help me um, when he when he can. So that's how I do that. <laughs> um, I also have questions about how I make my Cozy Memories blanket and what method that I use. So I will show you this first. I have a project page for my Cozy Memories blanket on, um, on Ravelry, so that will have a brief description of what I do. These, this is my Cozy Memories blanket. So what I do is I, I do 49 stitches, so 24, a center stitch and 24. And I do a, on the right side, when I get to the one stitch before the center stitch, I do a center double decrease. So that is you slip two stitches together knitwise, knit one stitch, pass two stitches over. And then on the wrong side, I knit all the stitches and then that center stitch I purl. And that gives you a really nice sort of raised ridge along this middle, really nice defined line. And the way that I am doing my blanket is I am doing it in this sort of formation. So right now I've done most of this side and I've done most of that side and I still need to do the bottom half. So my lines, these spines as it were, these sort of spines on the squares are going to run in these directions in the blanket once it's finished. So I'm having kind of like four quadrants or four quarters. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and I knit mine on three millimeter needles which is quite large, but I, I quite like it. I don't need a super dense um, sock yarn blanket and it's, it's nice. I like it. It's a good size. And my mini, uh, my squares use about five grams of, um, yeah, five grams, roughly 20 meters. Uh, I got a question about how I knit and purl. And uh, by the time this video goes up, I will have posted a, a how I knit video on YouTube. Uh, which will show you how I knit, how I purl, and how I do 2x2 two two ribbing. So hopefully that will be useful for you and I will link that in this um, in the description box below on YouTube and everywhere else that I post this video you will be able to find that as well. So I hope hopefully that will be clear and you'll be able to see that how I knit, how I purl. I'm a flicker, I knit with my right hand but I don't let go of the needle so I just use my finger to flick the yarn around the needle. Um, so that will be a separate video. I also get a question a lot about how I knit my socks, what sock patterns I recommend, and all that sort of stuff. So my favorite sock pattern for vanilla socks for me is my own Mina's two at a time sock pattern, because that's pretty much how I knit my socks. So I wrote the pattern based on how I knit my socks, um, which is cuff down, two at a time. I, I always knit my cuff separately. So I knit one cuff and I put it on DPNs. Then I knit the second, I knit everything on magic loops. So I knit my one cuff on magic loop, then I transfer the stitches to a DPN and put them aside. I knit the second cuff on magic loop. Then I transfer the first cuff back onto the magic loop needles. So now they're side by side. And I find by doing the ribbing separately, I one, get the ribbing done quicker. And two, um, having that fabric there already, like that 20 rows of ribbing already done, um, means working them two at a time is a lot less tricky from that point onwards. There's no twisting or stitches and twisting or cables and stuff. It's all, it sits nicely. Then I knit two at a time. Then I do fish lips kiss heel more often than not, um, because you can do that on magic loop two at a time without having to separate anything. There's no stitches picking up. It's quick, it's easy, totally worth doing it. Um, I knit one, knit the other, join back in the round, knit the foot, do my decreases and Kitchener the toes. That's how I knit my socks when it comes to vanilla socks. And I pretty much do the same thing with any pattern socks as well. Um, I just substitute in the pattern for the vanilla. Um, other patterns that are great as well out there is the Tin Can Knits Simple Collection. They have the rye socks, which is really good if you're new to socks. I've not knit those, but I've heard a lot and their patterns are really good. I've heard a lot about people really liking their simple collection and that um, it's really well explained if you're new to sock knitting, that would be a good one to start with. And there are so many other really good sock patterns out there 
um, for free vanilla patterns that you can go and check out. I know Susan B. Anderson has some, has one, and there are several others. Um, and even if you don't want to knit your socks two at a time, you can still use my pattern. It gives, it's basically just a recipe on how to knit socks. Um, so, so yeah, and I do have a yarn management video for how to do two at a time socks and manage your yarn to avoid getting tangles, which I'll again link with this um, video as well, which is, uh, um, which should be quite useful. And I will be refreshing that tutorial. I will probably be doing a new one with better lighting because I kind of filmed that one off the cuff in a hotel room. Um, but yeah. If you didn't want to do it two at a time, you don't have to. You can still follow the pattern and do one sock at a time. Um, but again, there are so many sock patterns out there. It's just a matter of searching and seeing what you would like. Um, I know a lot of people like the Hermione's Everyday Sock Pattern for the for the stitch counts and as a general uh, basic sock. And you don't have to do the texture pattern if you didn't want to. And with that, I think I've pretty much covered all of the main questions that people ask me on a regular basis. Um, I hope that has been useful. If it has, then great. If you have any other questions that I haven't answered, or if you feel like any of the answers I've given haven't fully answered the question, then please let me know. Um, and I'd be happy to answer your questions, any other questions that you have going forward in future episodes. So thank you for taking the time to join me today. And yeah, take care. I will see you soon. Bye.